I'm going to read you two little stories tonight from the book, and this first one is called Manure. Daddy's level of frugality was extreme, even for the 50s when I was grew up. He probably picked it up by living through the Depression. It was an admirable trait then. But now it had morphed into a curiosity, making us Blaine's the butt of many jokes, saturating our large lawn of our house each spring with fresh cow manure was one of Daddy's more laughable ventures, and people openly chided him. Let him laugh, he told Mama. The greenest lawn in town only cost me the gas and time to drive five miles each way for fertilizers. But John, the girls can't even step off the sidewalk without tracking the in. <laughs> the foyer stinks to high heaven. What's wrong with the commercial stuff? The price they ask is highway robbery. It's just packing shit, Lorraine. <laughs> the tracking and odor are only bad when it first soaks in. Have the girls vacuum the living room a couple of times a day, and that should take care of it. Well, they fight me about vacuuming, saying it smells worse than a barnyard. I usually end up doing it myself. Because of packing shit, I met Miss Myrtle. I don't know how Daddy found her, but one Saturday morning in early spring, he asked if I wanted to go with him to get lawn fertilizer. The place we're going is out on the west bench of Roosevelt, about a mile off the highway. The house is surrounded by locust trees, which bear big pods. You can pick some and take them to your class, Diane. I guess fifth graders still have show and tell, don't they? He hooked up the trailer and we were on the road by 8 o'clock. It was the same trailer that smashed my little toe when I was four. A sweltering day was at hand and I was already sweating so bad my legs stuck to the seat. Out on the highway, he warned, the lady we're getting the manure from is rather different. Different than what? Different than other women you know. So? So I'm just trying to prepare you, he chuckled. Try not to stare. He began whist whistling, funiculi, funicula. A heavy wind from the night before had blown dirt over the highway, and the air was heavy with dust. It made me cough, but I didn't have Daddy roll the window up because of the heat. We drove past sagebrush and boulders until finally we climbed the hill, turned off Highway 40, and made our way down a narrow lane with huge trees on both sides. Their branches met in the middle, forming a canopy over our heads and blotting out the sun. This is another world, a completely dark and green one. Occasionally, a piercing beam of sun edged through, a reality check. The road soon turned into a trail of many ruts, each a jolt back into time. Is this a real road, Daddy? Yes, he laughed. Miss Myrtle and her brother live down at the end of the lane. She doesn't drive and I've never seen him, so I expect this road doesn't get much use. That's their house ahead. Now a clearing, where the sun assaulted a tiny frame house, sheepishly peering from under vines. Morning glory, maybe. It sat squarely on a knob of lawn. Noting my wide eyes and open mouth, Daddy pointed out the window. Those are the trees, the locusts I told you about. Just look at the size of those pods, four feet long and hanging in clusters. Miss Myrtle feeds them to her horses and cows. Two dogs, one black with white spots and one white with brown spots, spotted us. They barked loudly and ran alongside the car, sometimes crossing in our path. Don't hit those dogs! They're just glad to see me, Diane. Probably remember me from last year. Chickens strutted the yard, pick, pecking the ground and squabbling with one another, <coughs> oblivious to our arrival. We passed a pig pen, identifiable by its smell, and turned behind the house to where the barn sat. The two-story structure dominated the place despite the encroaching green. Its bride appearance said, you will reckon with me even in this underworld. There she is, Daddy pointed a to a figure just inside the open door, pitching hay for her horses. That's a woman? <laughs> Take it easy, I told you she was different. Just pick pods while I'm loading the manure. We got out of the car and Daddy called to her in greeting. She shaded her eyes with a plain hand, laid down the pitchfork, 
stood and spit, sending a stream of tobacco juice three feet into the air. <laughs> Howdy do, Mr. Blaine, she caterwauled, flashing Daddy a wide grin that made her hawk-like nose seem small. She hasn't a tooth in her head. <laughs> Faded canvas bib overalls hung loosely from her tall, skinny frame, the legs traveling down into sturdy men's work boots, which were caked and smeared with clumps of dark green manure. Mosquitoes, drunken with pleasure, swarmed about them. A long-sleeved red flannel shirt, worn, un worn under the bibs, bore dark half-moons of armpit sweat, because although early morning, it was hotter than Hades. That shirt is to protect her from the mosquitoes, I thought, as I slapped vigorously, swat squashing three or four at a time. With a wrinkled blue checkered handkerchief, Miss Myrtle mopped her face and neck and then shoved it into her back pocket, all the while cursing the heat. And her skin weathered and stretched tightly like rawhide. A worn straw hat covered her head, yet I glimpsed silver gray hair swept back into a bun on the base of her neck. She darted around the car and grabbed my hand with the grip of one who's milked a lifetime of cows. <laughs> this here youngin must be your daughter, because she looks just like you, Mr. Blaine. I shrank back in shame, as always, when someone told me I looked like my short, fat, bald dad. <laughs> <laughs> I made myself smile and say hello. <laughs> Daddy and Miss Myrtle began work. She loosening up a big, rigid pile with a hefty stick, and Daddy shoveling the manure into our trailer. I walked around and gathered some of the leaves and flowers, making certain to get several pods from the locust trees. We were home in another hour, and Daddy began tossing the manure on the lawn as Mary and Mama pulled faces and held their noses. The following Thursday, Daddy came to my bedroom. I'm going over to Miss Myrtle's after school today for another load. Do you want to go? Did I ever. We're picking her up at Marion's at 4 o'clock. She rides in with the milk driver on Thursdays. Promptly at 4, we parked in front of the store. I climbed into the back seat so Miss Myrtle could sit in front. Out she came, loaded with two large brown grocery bags. I was as stunned to see her as I had been the week before. Now she was wearing her go-to-town clothes. A loose blue checkered house dress, severely starched, brown support stockings, and sturdy white Oxford shoes. Her hat was red felt with brightly colored flowers and beads. It was secured by a large hat pin, like I'd seen in early pictures of Grandma Blaine. Miss Myrtle wore tiny white gloves, which matched the white purse that swung from her forearm. Strangest of all was her makeup. Fire engine red lipstick, which drew attention to her toothless mouth, and two bright pink circles of rouge, one on each cheek. <laughs> Howdy, Mr. Blaine, and thank you for the ride home, she belted as Daddy put his, her grocery bags in the back seat with me. I peeked at the bags, in the bags as we rode along, hoping to see something exotic, but there was only coffee, can of tobacco, sugar, flour, and dried milk. Miss Myrtle talked Daddy's ear off for the full five miles. The horrible prices she had to pay, how her feet were killing her, how hot it was, and so on. Suddenly, she dug into her bosom and brought out some crumpled bills. Ha ha! I almost forgot this is where I keep my money. <laughs> you never know when you'll get mugged in town, so I put it in here instead of my purse. <laughs> Daddy went red and said nothing. <laughs> At the house, he carried Miss Myrtle's two grocery sacks to the door for her, and he and I went to load fertilizer. This time, I got to loosen the manure with the stick while Daddy shoveled the trailer full. Miss Myrtle came to the barn as we were finishing, and once again, she looked as she did when I met her the week prior. I liked her man look better, more natural. <laughs> One more load will do the trick, Miss Myrtle. Call the house if you're in town and need a ride home, Daddy said, getting into the car. Four days later, Miss Myrtle called our house. I answered and told her Daddy wasn't home. I didn't plan to be in town so soon, but my brother, he got sick. So I hitched a ride with the milk driver to get me some medicine. Tell your father I need a ride home. I'll be awaiting here at Marion's as usual. Now don't forget to tell him, girlie. I forgot all about him. 
Days later, Daddy asked, Diane, did Miss Myrtle call needing a ride home yesterday? I confessed that it was a few days before, and yes, I forgot to relay the message. Do you realize that means she had to walk on the highway five miles, he asked angrily. Then he simmered down, knowing I didn't do it on purpose. We'll go over after school. You need to go and apologize to her. I wanted to go, knew I needed to. We found her in the barn pitching hay, and although frightened, I, can, I quickly apologized. Well, Mr. Blaine, I'm glad you brought your daughter there to say her sorries, and I get to share part of her blame. I hadn't planned on going into town, but William, he's been right sick with the crew and my mustard plasters ain't done nothing for him, so I thought I'd get in and get some of that there paregoric, see if I could fix him up. I know the milkman made his run on Mondays, so I was out on the road by seven and waving him down. He give me a ride into town there. Five miles is quite a distance, Miss Myrtle, Daddy said, shaking his head. I'm real sorry Diane forgot to tell me. You see, it just came up, Mr. Blaine, or I'd have told you when you was here last Thursday. That guy at Marion's looked up your number and dialed it for me. I ain't used to using one of them there telephones. Daddy got out of the car and began shoveling the manure, tossing it into the bed of the trailer as Miss Myrtle pounded the pile with the stick. It was dry, flaky, and didn't smell too bad, even when the dust of it blew up by the car. Anyways, I wait there at the store until supper time. When I figures you ain't a comin', then I starts for home. I walks about three quarters of a mile when a car stops. I seen it was a young buck, probably headed over to Fort Duchesne. He motioned for me to get in, which I did because it was right hot by then and my face was a dripping sweat. I said, thank you kindly, young man. But he said nary word, just drove on. A mile down the road, he pulled over. I thought maybe he was getting out of the car, but no. You know what that young fella did, Mr. Blaine? She stopped poking the manure and looked Daddy squarely in the eye. Why, he undid his pants, and there it was, his manhood standing erect as a prairie dog by its mouth. <laughs> Daddy gasped, his eyes bugging out. He took a step and stumbled, overthrowing the manure which landed on the trunk of our car rather than in the trailer. Uh, Miss Myrtle, suck up, you old hilly bill, hillbilly, that Jim said, or you can just walk home. <laughs> well, I did me some pretty fast thinking, Mr. Blaine. I acted like I was going to get out, even open the door, but instead I just reached over, grabbed a hold of him, and twisted for dear life. <laughs> shit all over the lawn. <laughs> days later, days later I spotted a couple of bags of commercial lawn fertilizer out by the garage. <laughs> then there were more and our fresh cow manure days became history. Mary and I enjoyed being able to walk on the grass and cleaning the foyer was an easy Saturday job again 
making it unnecessary for, for us to fight over defrosting the refrigerator instead of vacuuming. <laughs>